There was an LPGA player that came to see me in my studio. I worked with her for four hours with the Brain Track Man. And as she was leaving about three years ago, she said, ha ha ha, almost like a joke. Gosh, it'd be so awesome to have the Brain Track Man while I'm playing so I know exactly where my brain is so that I can make the right adjustment. I didn't sleep that night. And I said, oh my gosh, what if there's a way to do that? I have a Brain Track Man without having it. Obviously, you can't wear the brain track when you're playing golf. So that's when I came up with the 1 to 10 system. And I tested it with over 3,000 golfers, over 1,000 golf scorecards. And I found that that system works extremely well. Hi, this is Mark Cook from Olathe, Kansas. And I play at Falcon Lakes Golf Course in Baser, Kansas. Brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com. This is Golf Smarter number 844. Jira Golf, a neuroscience approach to golf's mental game with the creator, Dr. Izzy Justice. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Dr. Justice. Hi, Fred. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for um, joining me today because we've got a topic that's that we've kind of talked about over the years, um, but we're going to take a completely different approach to it today is what I'm assuming. Um, and your your book is um, Jira Golf. Your Correct. website is jiragolf.com. And it's a neuroscience approach to golf's mental game. Yes. As opposed to a psychological approach to golf's mental game. Yes, that's right. So what is, let me ask you, you know, because this jumped off the page at me, you have Brain Track Man. Yes. What is Brain Track Man? All right. So most golfers at this point know what a Track Man is. A Track Man is a device that you use on the range and... um it sees what the naked eye cannot see, and it gives you all kinds of dimensions of the ball and the ball flight and the launch angles and spin rates and all those kinds of things. It's the same concept. Uh, I have a device that you can put on your brain wirelessly uh, using Bluetooth, and as a golfer is making a putt, a chip, uh, playing nine holes, 18 holes, I can follow them and I can see what the naked eye can't see. I can see exactly where their brains are. I can see what the cost of each shot is. Um, and because the brain, unlike your heart, your liver, or any other organ in the human body, the brain has electricity. So we have a measurement system of, elect of electricity. It's called Hertz, just like the frequency in a light bulb. And um, so this is what's you know, fundamentally, Fred, different between neuroscience and, uh, and psychology. Is uh, the Brain Track Man a product that's available to the public, or is this something that you've developed for your research? Yeah. So um, there are many commercial vir uh, uh, products out there, like bands and those kinds of things, um, and they do measure to some extent very high-level EEG kinds of things. The product that I have is, is, is a pretty sophisticated product that my team and I developed um, and it's not just the hardware. The hardware is kind of the easier part that goes on your head, um, but it's the software. Um, there are about 11 million neurons that are firing per second in our brain, and that's just normal. Um, and, you know, our brain is constantly in communication with everything in our body. How do you know that you're hungry? How do you know that you have to go to the bathroom? How do you know that there's a twitch that you have in your back? How do you know that you're feeling hot over here? So, you know, subconsciously, you know, our brain is, is, is operating 85 to 95 percent of the time subconsciously. So the software that my team and I developed, we were able to extract those commands that are going for neuromuscular coordination, which is what physical activity is. A lot of target sports like basketball or darts or soccer or football, you are sending the ball to a target. And that requires a sequencing of, of the muscles that requires your muscle to put a force that you want on that ball or whatever instrument that you have to send it at the exact point or geo location. All of that coordination is happening in the brain. So 
So my my brain trackman, and that's why I call it brain trackman, is specifically for um, you know measuring uh, the accuracy uh, and the ef- the efficiency with which the brain can perform neuromuscular coordination. What is your background? So I'm a neuroscientist. Um, so as I was sharing earlier. Um, uh, uh, you know, neuroscience is a is a cutting edge science. Uh, the first time that the human anab- anatomy was mapped was in the 16th century. So that in the 16th century, 500 years ago, was the first time that a doctor from from Belgium drew out exactly where the liver is, where the kidney is, where the tendon is, where the muscle is, and all those kinds of things. The first brain anatomy was done about 12 years ago. Wow. So just to show you that we are literally living in the golden age. And Fred, it's it's because if you think about it, I can open the chest and I can look at the heart or the liver or the kidney and I can replace those things. But if I even as much as cut open, you know, a quarter of an inch incision into the brain, I could paralyze somebody. And we've known that. So the technology, the digital scanning technology, the EEG, the, the, the electrical measurement uh, uh, mapping technology was just did not exist. And so this is why we're uh, the the information that I'm going to share with you is quite literally cutting edge. Unbelievable. Why golf? Why did you use this <laughs> your your expertise in this information to apply it to golf? Yeah. Well, I don't apply just to to golf. I work with oh, many sure. athletes, and, and and I work with 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 lots of of coaches and assistant coaches and athletes. Essentially, anywhere where there is a target sport. Um, but golf, you, you are right. I did you know golf because my son plays golf. Um, I uh, I play golf also, and you know golf is 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 incredibly unique. In, and this is why I think. Golf is a mental health risk, especially if you play it competitively. You know, golf has a very organic timeout. Uh, in many sports, if you want to stop play, you have to call a timeout like basketball. But between shots, you have a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes before you drive to your ball or you walk to your ball. And that's more than enough time for your brain to ascribe an enormous amount of judgment to the shot that you just hit to the score, to, to where you stand. And we have measured this now. And whether you're aware of it or not, um, when you're on the fifth hole, on the on the 12th hole, your subconscious is well aware, well aware. And your baseline EEG is, is in many cases, depending on where your score is, a lot higher than where it was when you, when you first started. And so your ability to then coordinate neuromuscular coordination becomes severely compromised. So your brain is already doing all of this neuromuscular work. It's judging shots. It's judging your peers' shot. It's, you know, it's blaming. It's, it's, it's you know, one of our defense mechanism is, is to not blame ourselves. It's the wind. It's the lie. It's the bad break. It's the this. And, you know, now my round is gone. And, and, you know, and, hey, I just, I was hitting it so well on the range or yesterday. And, so this is our subconscious that is completely taking over. It's basically doing its job, believe it or not. This is not a, a sign that something is wrong with you. This is the brain doing its job. Um, but that's not good for golf because your brain, like in basketball, if you miss a shot, you've got to run very quickly to the other end of the floor. Your brain doesn't have time to ascribe all this judgment. Um, so, so, so that's part of, of, of the reason why golf is so fascinating is because the the cognitive role of of uh, of the brain in golf arguably is higher than I would say in most sports. So interesting that you say you ascribe judgment because that's so true. That's that's what it is. Uh, I I play with someone who regularly has a reason for every time he hits the ball that it didn't happen exactly than it happened. And if it did happen the way it happened, he's like, yep, just how I drew it up. But <laughs> like, yeah. there's always a judgment. Uh, and, and to me, it's like, that's golf. It's, that's what happens. Yeah. Well, it's, the brain is doing the same thing. Like if you go meet someone new, let's say you have a business meeting and you're meeting at a coffee shop 
your brain is doing the same thing. Your brain is sizing up that person and saying, oh, they're, they're too tall. They're too short. Oh, they, they, they do this weirdly. Do I like this person? Do I trust uh, this person? It is our brain's job to evaluate everything that is happening. And when you don't have teammates to blame, which is what makes golf, uh, in one of my earlier books, I talked about golf being the ultimate, and, and I want to say this carefully, I talked about golf being the ultimate nudist sport. Like, it's just you and you. Like, you are oh, out there by yourself, right? There's <laughs> no yes. It's just you and you. And, you know, there's no coach to blame. There's no teammate. You can't blame anything else. It's you are out there exposed and everyone can see it. Like, you're completely vulnerable in those situations. And the brain doesn't like that. It doesn't like to be vulnerable. It likes to be secure. It likes to feel safe. And so when it is vulnerable and it is exposed uh, because every shot is not perfect, then that judgment starts. Your brain is basically doing exactly what it is designed to do, which is not helpful because golf is a cumulative sport. In tennis, you can lose the first two sets and come back and win the next three sets and you're fine. But in golf, if you have a double bogey and a triple bogey, guess what? They count towards your score at the end. Fascinating. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Izzy Justice, um, the scientist behind neuroscience of golf and brain track man. Um, and we're going to dig deeper into this uh, because it's really interesting right after this. This episode of Golf Smarter is brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, home of the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. I need to tell you all about the Eagle Eye Rangefinder because if you're in the market for a rangefinder, stop what you're doing, stop doing your research, and just get one of these from MyGolfingStore.com. It's my favorite rangefinder, and it's got all the premium features you need, like slope technology, an 800-yard range, and flagpole lock vibrating sensor that just knocks out any issue you may have with shaky hands. It's remarkable. And the thing is, it's a fraction of the cost of all the other rangefinders out there. It's called the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. I was a little skeptical when I first heard from my golfing store about this rangefinder that they're charging $260 for, which is a fair price because that's kind of in the middle of the pack because there's some really expensive rangefinders out there. But after using it, I just stopped thinking about that and the price because it didn't matter because this worked so well and it's so easy to use. Raise the rangefinder to your eye, find the pin. The eagle eye will automatically lock onto your target. Again, even if you have shaky hands. And then it's going to vibrate when the laser has locked onto the pin. And here's the best part. Like I said, usually this will retail for about $260, even on their website. But Golf Smarter listeners can take advantage of an incredible offer that we've worked out, 50% off. So for only $129, you can have the Eagle Eye Rangefinder in your bag in a couple of days. Just go to mygolfingstore.com slash golfsmarter. That's mygolfingstore.com slash golfsmarter. And you'll see that $129 price right there. Jump on it. Now, it's a limited time deal. I want to warn you about this. It's not going to last a long time. So you need to take advantage of it. If you're thinking about getting one, if you want to buy a gift for a friend, and if you're not happy with the one you have, then please check it out. MyGolfingStore.com slash GolfSmarter. The Eagle Eye Rangefinder at 50% off, only $129. And I'll put a link in today's show notes that's going to send you directly to MyGolfingStore.com slash GolfSmarter. Dr. Justice, you have alluded to it Briefly, and I, I want to dig deeper on this idea because we've talked to so many sports psychologists on this show talking about the mental game and how uh, we can improve our mental and our emotional game to play better golf. Let's, let's pick it apart. Let's tease it apart first and just explain the difference between neuroscience and psychology. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And <clears throat> 
I want to be very respectful and honor the work of psychologists because I am not one. But I think that they're brothers and sisters of the same family. They, mm -hmm. We are both trying to improve the human condition. We are both trying to understand and decode who we are. But we go about it completely differently. So psychology is an observational science. I watch your behaviors. I watch your, your, your attitudes. And I try to change those. Psychology is, is the why. It's, the, it's understanding the engine that is causing those those behaviors it's it's exactly what's happening in the brain the brain and how your brain has interpreted a stimuli is what ultimately dictates the downstream behavior or actions that that you see um, i don't view psychology as wrong i just view it as a little bit outdated it's almost like having a road atlas i'm old enough where when I grew up, every car had a, had, a, had a road atlas, a big 11 by 17 sheet. And today we have GPSs. Guess what? Most of those road atlases would probably work. But nobody uses them because we have a GPS now. It doesn't mean that they're not important or not, not relevant. So the brain trackment and neuroscience, because we've just been living in that age, psychology is 60, 70 years old. Neuroscience is about 15, 20 years old. Uh, in terms of just the depth of of of, of the science, so I, I view neuroscience as just the evolution of it. Um, and like I said, we're literally living in the in the golden age. The other thing, uh, Freddie, if I can just uh, keep going here, please. Um, so what we've discovered is that muscles literally have no memory, right? So muscles is not where your skills live. When you go hit balls on the range and you figure out how to chip or putt or swing something, that that aha moment does not go to your muscles. Muscles have no cognitive storage capability. Case in point, if think about quadriplegics, you know, their brain works fine and their muscles work fine, but the communication between those two is is uh, is cut off. So they can't coordinate anything. So it is the brain that fundamentally controls three things that are critical to all target sports. Number one is muscle sequencing. So all of golf, every whether it's a putting stroke, a chipping, a full swing, your muscles go one way, backswing, and then they go another way. So that is a, that is a coordination. Muscles don't do that by themselves. They get the signal from the brain to how to do that because it's the brain where your, your skill is stored. The second thing that the, that the brain controls, it's executed by the muscles, Fred, but the brain, the brain controls force. I'm sure sometimes you've hit a putt or you've, you've hit a golf shot and say, oh, I hit it perfect. You think you hit it perfect, but it came up short or it was, was too much. Well, because your force that you applied was obviously higher or lower than you wanted to. So again, muscles don't decide how hard to hit something. They execute that. And it is the brain that tells the muscles and then the last thing that the brain coordinates, probably the most important thing, in my opinion, so this is an opinion, um, is the ability to hold a target. So golf is one of those unique sports, Fred, where your eyes are not on the target. When, I, when you're putting the ball, your, balls are, your eyes are down on the ball. They're not at the hole. Same thing with a full golf shot. So imagine a basketball player shooting a shot and their eyes are not on, on, on the basket. Well, suddenly that shot is incredibly hard. You will never see a basketball player or a football player or any other target sport where their eyes aren't on, on the target. So it's the brain that has to remember why your eyes are not on the target, while they're down there towards the ground, where the target actually is. So those three functions, again, muscle sequencing, force, and ability to hold the target, all are in your brain. And what we've discovered, Fred, is that there are two frequencies under which, so in terms of state of brain, under which that collaboration of sequencing force and target with the muscles is the best. And that is alpha and theta brain waves. So these are brain waves between 5 and about 15 hertz. When you have that level of frequency, which is low, by the way, that means when the noise in your head is low, that means your senses are wide open. There's no brain traffic in your head. And when your senses are wide open, then you can see, you know, um, see your target, hold your, hold, your, hold your target. When the brain frequency is low, that memory, so they're called neurons, can travel from your brain to your muscles so that the 
right sequencing, how you've trained, the right force, and the right target is held. The minute that that frequency goes high, one or all three of those get compromised. This is why one of the accidental discoveries that I made with my brain trackman was the concept of the most expensive shot in golf. So let me, first of all, define what that means. What does most expensive shot, and I don't mean in terms of stroke, and I don't mean in terms of, you know, golf. I mean in terms of brain. What is the worst shot that you can hit that across the board, irrespective of your handicap, will send your brain so high and for so long that it takes a long time to get back to that alpha theta? And that, the most expensive shot, is a missed makeable putt. So this is typically inside five feet, but any putt that you feel like you can make that you missed, I have found that your brainwaves spike so high, and they say spike so high, that it can take as much as a couple of hours. So that's, you know, another 10, 12 holes before they come back down. And it's much worse than hitting a tee shot out of bounds. Now, your brainwaves do go up there too, but it, it goes up not nearly as much as a Mr. Makeable putt. So this is what the break, well, this is what the brain track man has allowed us to do. I would have never known that without the brain track man. I'm, I'm <laughs> just going. Yesterday happened to me. It's exactly what oh. happened, but it was the 18th hole, so I didn't have to drag it around. But I had, I had. Uh, it was, it's a long par four. I crushed the ball right up the middle uh, on off the drive, and. This is a hole where many times I've had to go five iron or hybrid or even longer, depending on the wind, for my approach shot. And I had a nine iron shot, right, to the green, and I put it within nine feet. Oh, my gosh. And I three putted. <laughs> and it went, pa- it was, went downhill, went past the hole, and I had an easy, you know, four footer back, and I missed it. And I was like, I'm still pondering. I'm still going over it. There so you it's go. Lull- you yeah. just proved my point. Yes. Oh, absolutely. my gosh. So is that what you meant earlier when you said the cost of each shot? Yes. So, so your brain is already doing this. Your brain is already giving a cost value because it's doing its job. For elite athletes, what I teach them to do is – to make a deposit towards that cost. So it is impractical, almost impossible, to not have your brain judge a shot. The neuroscience has proved that. Like, so I, in, in, in Jira Golf, we created a simple scale. It's literally simple. A scale from 1 to 10. So that's the Jira score. So the scale is between what you wanted to do with this shot and what the result was, how much of a surprise was it to your brain on a scale from 1 to 10? So if you did exactly what you wanted to do with your shot, that's a star. That's like a star or a 1. And if what you wanted to do and what the result is it was, was completely different, that's a 10. And so what I found is that by giving a shot that kind of a number, you're essentially telling yourself, what is the state of your brain? So there was an LPGA player that came to see me in my studio, and I worked with her for four hours with, with, the, with the brain track man. And as she was leaving about three years ago, she said, ha, 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 almost like a joke. Gosh, it'd be so awesome to have the brain track man while I'm playing so I know exactly where my brain is so that I can make the right adjustment. Ha, ha, ha. And, and, and I said, ha, ha, ha. And I didn't sleep that night. And I said, oh, my gosh, what if there's a way to do that? I have a brain track man, but we, without having it, because you, obviously you can't wear the brain track man when, when you're playing golf. So that's when I came up with the 1 to 10 system. And I tested it with over 3,000 golfers, over 1,000 golf scorecards, and I found that that system works extremely well. So if I hit a, if my goal is to hit the middle of the fairway and I push it a little bit and it's on the right side of the fairway, that's probably a one or a two. That tells me that my brain from that ideal alpha theta brainwave has only gone up a little bit. So the adjustment that I have to make is not that much. But if I want to hit the middle of the fairway and now I'm in the right woods, but I'm in play, that's probably a six or a seven. That means I am along, I'm beginning to get away away from alpha theta. That means for my next shot, 
my sequencing, my force, and my target is going to be compromised. If I want to go to the middle of the fairway and I hit it out of bounds, well, that's a 10. That means that if I don't do something, the odds that, that either the next shot or the subsequent shot, it, those three things are going to be off. My sequencing, my, um, uh, my force, and, and my ability to hold, hold the target. And I'll just give you one comment. I have a, I have a 16-year-old who plays junior golf, um, and he's a two-time national champion, and I, I walk with him. I, I, Congratulations. I walk, uh, Congratulations. Well, thank you. Well, to him. He's the one hitting, hitting all no, the shots. No, to you. So, <laughs> you get to have be congratulated as the parent. Oh, yes. thank you, uh, proud dad. But as you know, golf Absolutely. changes. And, but I have never. He probably plays about twenty two, twenty five tournaments a year. I have never been to a junior golf tournament watching him play with two or three other boys. Where he always plays with boys that are longer than him, better skilled than him, better ball strikers than him. But every one of them in every tournament I've seen it they're always one bad shot or one bad hole away from, from collapsing. You know, I see it all the time, and you just don't know when that bad shot is going to happen. This is a short story, but there was a tournament he was playing at the, on the 14th hole. My son was two over through, through 14 holes. This kid was three under. And on the 15th hole, it was a short par four, and there was water in front of it, and he went for it, and it went in the water. He took a drop, and you could see him rushing everything now. He put three balls in the water, took like a 12 on that hole, oh and gosh. went bogey, double bogey, bogey to finish. Yeah. And Hunter yeah. ended up, my son ended up beating him by like six strokes, not because my son was better than him at, than at golf, but that's what I mean was that this poor kid didn't even know that his brainwaves got so high that his ability to make decisions, good decisions, to 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 get his brain back that his primary problem when he hit the first shot into the water was not golf his primary problem was he had to get his brain waves down yeah. and and that's really really all i teach is you know is the brain trackman has allowed me to do literally thousands of these neuro hacks that you can do in a matter of seconds literally seconds that are the equivalent of 20 or 30 minutes of yoga so clearly, in, 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 in many sports that I coach, you cannot call a timeout and say, oh, I'm really upset right now. I'm playing really badly. Let me go do 30 minutes of yoga, and I'll be right back. Like, that's not practical. It's a good thing to do, but it's not practical. Right. So the brain track man has allowed me to say, okay, what else can we do that can allow the brain to have the same cognitive effect, not the physical effect of yoga or swimming or taking a, uh, a jog or walk, and so that's how we discovered all of these neuro hacks that you can do that are all based on scientifically proven methods to, to bring those, those brain waves down. And here's the beauty of golf, Fred. Golf gives you time between shots to do just that. So if you have a scale of 1 to 10, which is the Jira scale, that scale tells you if, if my shot was a 2, right, I don't need to do much. You know, maybe I can just do some light breathing. If I, it's a five or six, then I got to do one of my other ones. And if it's a ten, I really have to do something. I call it your your red card. You have to do something that can quickly and instantly bring bring those brain waves down. Fascinating. And we're gonna take another time out. We'll be right back. Dr. Justice, I want to get deep into neuro hacks, uh, what specifically they mean and what we can do about them. But I need to ask you this because this is something that has been discussed many times over the years in Golf Smarter, um, whether it's uh, true or not. Is there such thing as muscle memory? Coming from a neuroscience perspective, not a mental game approach, uh, but coming from the science, is there such thing as muscle memory? That's a great question, and 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 I have a what I think is a good answer to that question. So the direct answer is no. There is no cognitive tissue in our muscles. What our muscles have are nerve endings. Those nerve endings contract and constrict each muscle so that you can do whatever it is that you want to do. 
But the intention of muscle memory is, I think, actually good and pure. Mm. People said, oh, if I just practice, then I'm building muscle memory. Muscle memory is confused for automatic or subconscious. And these were people who never understood the brain, but they just said, oh, if I hit 10,000 balls, which, by the way, is not true. Malcolm Godwell's work on on 10,000 reps to master something, even he himself later said that that was just a guesstimate. It was more philosophical than it was scientific. But Malcolm Gladwell perpetuated this idea that, oh, if I just practice and practice my butt off, and if I just do more reps, then I'm building muscle memory. That is not true. However, there is value to doing something repeatedly as long as you understand that you are ultimately trying to store something in the brain. A lot of my clients are golf instructors, Fred. And one of the things that I've told them is that if you give a lesson at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning, the chances are about 80% of your lesson is going to be lost before 5 p.m. By the student. And that's because, huh? By the student. By the student, yes. Yes. And that's not intentional. But our brain right now, Fred, is consuming way too much stimuli between our phones and the lives that we are living that there's too much competition. One of the accidental discoveries made by neuroscientists, not by me, by the way, but my peers, was what does the brain do at night? We never asked that question because we said, oh, the brain is resting. Well, peers of mine who had the same machine on people that that were sleeping discovered that it turns out in the world that we live in today, in the circadian rhythm that we live in today, it's only at night that the brain stores. So the brain is taking inventory of everything that happens during the course of the day, during the experiential part when your senses are wide open, But in terms of storing stuff in the brain so that you can retrieve it, that's only happening at night because that's when the senses are shut off. But because the stimuli are so much, the brain is having to pick and choose organically, subconsciously, what memories it's going to store. And given a choice, the brain will always store the negative experiences more than the positive ones. If I burn my finger on a coffee pot yesterday, today all day long, if I smell coffee anyway, I'm going to jump. And I'll tell everybody, oh, I burnt my finger. I won't tell them about the 20 other good things that happened to me yesterday. But I'll tell them about my my little burnt finger. But that's the brain doing its job. Our brain needs to remember our threats and our dangers because it is a survival mechanism. So muscle memory is, 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 is a term that I think needs to be buried. We need to give it a very graceful funeral. (laughs) <laughs> because, number one, it's not true. And number two, even the best instruction or the best learning is at the mercy of everything else that you do during the course of that day before you sleep. Mm. So one of the things that I teach a lot of my athletes is a nighttime routine where if they've been to the range for two hours or putting for an hour, is at nighttime, that one hour before they go to bed, they have to tell the brain what they did well so that they can tell their brain to basically store it. And that's another part of athletic performance that a lot of professional athletes are beginning to do now because they've realized what I've just told you, is that all the practice that they do and all all that stuff, it's going to be at the mercy of whatever competing stimuli life is throwing at us. And like I said, look at our cell phones. We are literally taking global stimuli with us wherever we go. It's too much for the brain. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Um, So you work with uh, athletes. You work with golfers. Um, What is the difference between what you, I don't know if you're teaching or observing, uh, but the work that you do with athletes versus what a sports psychologist would do? Yeah. Well, I think our objectives are the same. We both care about our clients. We want them to be at their best. And what I try to do is I try very, very hard to stay away from cliches. I never tell anybody to hit one shot at a time. I never tell anybody to to stay in in the moment because the brain is not designed to do those things. Wow. Uh, so... And the other thing that I do is I found that every human, every golfer I've ever worked with, and I've worked with hundreds of them now, 
And again, I have done over 10,000 brain scans on golfers. I think no one has done more than me. That happened by accident. That wasn't a goal of mine. But I have found that every human brain is different. We're at a different age in our life. We have different noises in our head, different competing priorities. I had a pro golfer who was going through a divorce. And no matter what, what technique we used with him, his baseline never went down for a whole year. Hmm. Because, you know, if, if, if God forbid, if, if you've been through a divorce, you just know all of, the legal, all of the legalities and the paperwork and the back and forth, the emotional trauma. It's just a lot for, for a human being to go through. I mean, take, take Tiger Woods in 2008 when he hit that, that fire hydrant. I mean, he never won a major for another 10 years after that. And because suddenly his vulnerability was exposed and, you know, you could see in his brain that his brain had changed. He was more aware of, of sort of everything, you know, around him. But the work that I do is I use the brain track, man, unlike psychologists. I don't guess. I know exactly where your brain waves are. And I can tell. So, for example, one of the things that I do is I put the brain track, man, and I watch people while they are putting. Because putting is, of all the golf, golf swings, putting is the one that requires the most accuracy, right? Because if you miss, your, if you miss the middle of, of the fairway by five yards, you're still in the fairway. If you miss a putt by five millimeters, you've missed a putt. And your brain knows that. And your brain knows that there's a finality with missing a putt, unlike missing a fairway. So, so when I put the brain track man on somebody putting, I can tell exactly where their mind has wandered. And guess what? The average human being, your mind wanders every three seconds. In other words, every three seconds, you are no longer where your body is. And so if you think of a putting routine as 15 seconds, 16 seconds, that means there are at least four or five points where your brain has thought about something else. Don't leave it short. Don't leave it long. I got to make this for par. I got to keep it going. I just... On the last putt that was like this, I missed it high or I missed it low or I made it or those kinds of things. So what the other thing that I discovered, Fred, was that the biggest distraction to the human brain is ourselves. I work with a PGA Tour player and he told me that on the course, the biggest distraction are the doors of the, of the, of the Porta John. Like they're just, they just slam. And so if I'm swinging, if I'm swinging a club and I hear, I hear someone scream, it makes perfect sense when the person completely duffs the ball, right? Because someone's screaming in your backswing, correct? Does that make right. sense? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what's worse is if you, if you distract yourself. If when you're downswing, you say, don't go left or don't hit it in the water. That's even worse than someone yelling at you because it's internal. And we're doing that constantly. So I can, my brain trackman allows me to see in your routine where you are. And so the awareness, because I will, I, oh my gosh, you have no idea, Fred, how many times I've said, oh, your, your brain spiked right there. I was like, no, it didn't. I said, dude, it's like right there. It went boom, <laughs> boom. And then he'll say, oh yeah, you know, you know, you're right. I did think that. So even players aren't aware of when their brains are wandering. And as soon as they wander in competition, they normally don't wander to a good place. Yep. <laughs> They don't think about the best shot you've hit. They don't think about, you know, the, the purity of, of your stroke or, or, or those kinds of things. So I give you a long answer. But again, I am using a device. I'm taking guesswork out. I'm not talking about behaviors and attitudes. I, I know that if your brain is in alpha theta mode, hands down, this is fact, not opinion, your sequencing, your force, and your ability to hold the target is going to be right. I've never changed anyone's golf swing. I'm not qualified to do that. I've never changed anyone's putting stroke. I don't know anything about the equipment side of golf beyond, you know, what a six handicapper would. But I know a lot about the brain. And over and over again, I have found that if I can get a player to alpha and theta mode, suddenly they have the perfect swing. They have the perfect putting stroke. Because in alpha theta mode, their senses, so the brain has five doors, it only has five doors. It only has five doors through which it can change. And those are five senses. So when the frequency is low, it will see the hole. It will feel the ball rolling. It will see the ball flight. And it will tell the brain to do what you want it to do. When there's a lot of noise in the head, our senses are clogged. 
So a lot of our sensory, which all natural athletes love to have, um, are, are completely compromised. So all I try to do, Fred, is I try to teach people the awareness of when they're not alpha and theta brain waves. So I have a, a, a zero gravity chair in my, in my studio. So I don't know if you've, if you've ever been in one, but it puts you in a, in, a, in, a, in a position where no other part of your body is holding another part of your body. And I have people listen to some alpha theta music. And in five minutes I, afterwards, I say, how do you feel? And they say, oh my gosh, like, I feel like I took a 30 minute nap. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, that's alpha theta. Anything that's not that means your brain waves are high. So now they have a baseline. And then when we go out to the course, and I can see on their face and I can see where it's going up. So, oh, it just went up. Okay, now when I go play f- for real, I'll be aware of that. And the trick is, is not bad thoughts. It is okay to have bad thoughts. You cannot control having bad thoughts. The trick is to recognize them and make the JIRA adjustment. If you hit a 10, you want to do something completely versus if you hit a 2. So even that scale has told people... I've even trained caddies. They've been players with their caddies that have come to me, and I've given them the same language because a lot of times, you know, players start doing things fast, and they don't even know that they're doing things fast. And doing things fast is a symptom of high brain waves. When the brain waves are vibrating much higher than 15 hertz, well, you naturally start walking fast. You naturally start thinking fast, which is even worse. And then one of those three things, sequence, force, and target, you're done. Mm. Fascinating. Fascinating. We're going to take another time out. This is so interesting. I have so many more questions and we'll be back right (laughs) after this. Well, you proudly bragged, if I can use the word bragged, about your child's success on the golf course. Let's talk about your game for a moment. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know... Um, how you've implemented your research into your own game and how's your game these days? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I am a, I'm a solid seven, seven handicapper. Um, I'm 50, I'm 53 years old and the strongest part of my game is my short game. And I will tell you that it is the strongest part of, of my game because over every single shot, I have a sequence. And I say, the first thing that I need to do is to make sure that I am in alpha theta mode. And the dispersion of my misses when I'm in alpha theta mode is very, very small. I don't hit perfect shots, but my misses are not bad at all. Because in the short game, it's not physical. I mean, a two-year-old can physically hit any short game shot. They may not have the technique, but physically, it's not hard to hit a 60-foot putt. But that's what I basically tried to do. But I'm a human being, and I also judge shots. So I try to be aware, and I try to make adjustments as I go along. What people will tell you about my game is two things. Number one, I have a great short game, especially putting and chipping and, and those kinds of things. Um, but I am old, so I don't have a lot of yardage and, 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 and distance. But the other part of it is that my scores are very consistent. And, and that's how my son plays golf. You know, my son's good day will be two, one, two, three under, and my son's bad days will be two, three over. Wow. And every, every round is just like that. He plays with a ton of other juniors who their best rounds might be a 66 or, or 67, but their worst rounds are like 85, 86, 87. I mean, they can go, their swings are just enormous. So that's, I think, one of the beauty of, 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 being in control of your brain as, as your 15th club, because unlike, unlike any other club that you have, you are using your brain over every shot and in between shots. And if somehow, you know, people don't think of golf as an endurance sport, but it is an endurance sport. Golf is four, five, six hours. That is as much of an endurance, mental endurance test as it is, because you're only hitting the ball for less than 12 minutes in that five hours. So, and like I said, in three seconds, the mind wanders. And on average, it takes 20 minutes to come back from that wandering. So, you know, there are so many books out there right now that talk about 
the cognitive state of sort of where we are and how much our mind is wandering, how we don't have focus, it's because their brain is is just saturated right now. There's just so much going on, and I'm no different. I do two, three hundred emails a day. I am on conference calls. I am doing this. I am doing that, and. I love golf because it's outside. I love golf because it's a test between me and me at the end of the day. Um, and you and, love golf you because know, you and your golf. son get to play together. That's true. That is absolutely true. So um, is, he a, is he one of your clients or does he just know this just by having dinner with you every day? I no, mean, what makes you know, him so I, good? About, uh, you know, does, he, does he utilize this information? Absolutely he does. And... You know, when, when, when professional golfers come to my home to take a lesson from me, he, and this is since he was six, seven years old, he sees them. And I think he realized very quickly that they're just people. Right. And he sees them and getting not frustrated. freaks of and nature he, like an NBA and yes, NFL yes. player. And, and, you know, even now he's 16, but he's still a kid to them. And so they love talking to him. Mm. And so he's become friends with many of them. Because he's a kid and because he loves... So he's just learned a lot from them also organically. But yes, uh, he is a client. I have taught him. But as you know very well, I don't know if you're a parent, the way that you teach a kid has to be the back door. You know, so I found that when when tour players come to my home uh, from all tours and he sees me working with them and sometimes they'll let him come and watch. Mm. And the best part of it is that he sees the results of it. You know, um, I, I, I used to do Ironmans. I've done five full Ironmans, eight half Ironmans. Wow. And I used to tell myself, I used to tell myself at the beginning of a race, I am not the fastest swimmer. I'm not the fastest biker. And I sure as heck am not the fastest runner. But over the course of 17 hours, I'm going to make better decisions than everybody else. Mm. And I always finish in the top third, even though I was old and I don't have a very athletic background. But... You know, what I found is that it's translated to his schoolwork, too. And that's why I love golf is because golf is, is such a microcosm of, of life. You know, I, I tell all of my pro golfers, all of my clients that who you are off the course is who shows up on the course. It's not the other way around. And so when my clients come to me, my goal is not just to help them lower their scores. My goal is to help them be happier. Mm. Enjoy lives, have better relationships. Be because lower scores does not lead to happiness. That is absolutely true. Absolutely true. So his grades are off the charts. He has That's a true. 4.95 GPA. He's on the Stanford uh, online high school program, which is very, oh, wow. very, uh, very, <laughs> yeah. very hard to get into. But it's the same thing. If he's trying to solve a problem and he neurohacks his brain the same way that he did on a golf course, his ability to lower the traffic in his brain so that his brain, his search engine can work and remember things that he has studied or learned significantly enhances. So this is why I'm saying that golfers have a very unique opportunity where if they apply these tools, not only will their scores get better, but they will then walk off the golf course and be able to do many parts of their life well because it's your brain that is the ultimate commentator of your life your brain is a running you know Jim Nance like you know <laughs> your brain is doing that nonstop for everything that's going on and if you can control that you can live a much richer life hmm. all of life exists in your brain it's your brain's interpretation of everything that is happening that is your reality I, I know is when my when my I have two sons and and they're uh, they're adults now um but when they were teenagers, I remember us going, realizing that we had to go as, you know, 16 year olds like yours, we had to go from being a manager to a consultant. So you'd call that the back door. But yeah, that's absolutely that's right. the case. Uh, I, I think of a player like Colin Morikawa. Um, I don't know if you've worked with him, but he seems to have the ability uh, in watching him play in, in his situational games he has this ability to block things out and focus on exactly what the task is at that moment. Yeah, no, I have not worked with him. Uh, I, I, I know him in the same way that I think any fan would, but I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of his. 
And again, even the term that you just use is not a term that I recommend. I don't recommend people, and I've heard this before, say block things out because that that is a judgmental approach. And, and I'm okay. saying this from a learning perspective. I tell people, whatever negative thought you have, acknowledge it. Mm. And there's a term that I use yeah. called acknowledge and replace. Because the worst thing that you can do with a negative thought is pretend it's not there or try to block it. In order to pretend it's not there or block it, you're actually doing the opposite of what you need to do, which is you're increasing your brain waves because now you're fighting yourself. Instead, what I do is say, acknowledge it. Your brain just said, and the most dangerous word for a golfer internally, like I told you externally, it's the door banging, like when a door bangs in your downswing, like, yeah. whoa, where'd that come from? <laughs> internally, the loudest noise that causes is, is the word don't. Mm. Don't go left. Don't go right. Don't hit in the water. Don't leave it short. Don't make a bogey. Like, d- just think about this, Fred. In order for your subconscious to conjure the word don't, how many memories have to be retrieved? And are those memories good or bad? They're mostly not good. So I tell people, when you say don't leave it short, acknowledge it quickly and replace it with, this is where I want to send the ball. So I prefer the term acknowledge and, and, and replace as opposed to one shot at a time or a lot of these cliches. Uh, by the way, they're very well-intentioned cliches, but I am not a fan of cliches at all because they're broad. They mean different things to different people, and they're not scientific enough. They're, they don't have the efficacy of it. So I'm not a fan of one shot at a time be in the moment. I know what they mean, by the way, and, and they mean very good things. But how do you, I'm more interested in how do you stay one shot at a time? How do you stay in the moment? How do you block those, you know, what you were saying? But, you know, some people do this naturally. Let me share something with you. If you ask any golfer to describe their best, well, let's just do it with you, Fred. Think of the best round you've ever had. Okay. Okay. And tell me what you were thinking or, or feeling during that round. Go ahead. Give me like five one words. Um, disconnected. Peaceful. Let's keep it at two. I, I don't want to spend calm. all this time you, thinking about it. Calm? Were you calm? Uh, oh, incredibly calm. Yes. And okay. um, breathing. Pacing. Pacing. Okay. So I have asked that question to every athlete, to every coach in just about every sport. And they've all given me the same answer, which is a mutation of what you said. You said peaceful, disconnected, calm, breathing, pacing. If you ask any golfer to describe their best round, they will give you something very similar to what you just said. Mm -hmm. It is not a secret what the attributes are of your best round, and it's all cognitive. Nobody said, oh, my back swing was in the perfect position or my ball striking was perfect, or, I, or my downswing was, my, my right elbow was right there, or my follow through was just perfect. Or I was, no one says that. So it is not a secret. It has never been a secret. What the attributes are, Fred, of when all of us are at our best, we are calm, we are focused, we are intentional, nothing bothers us. We, are, we, we can feel or sense anything. I've asked baseball pitchers, like, you know, when you were pitching really well, what were you thinking? And they would say things to me like, I could not hear a single person in the stands. Hmm. I could feel the catches met. I could feel the ball in my hand. I was calm. Nothing bothered me. I was just present. These are all cognitive attributes. And so when you ask a player, okay, if you want to be your best, what do you have to go work on? The mental side is the last thing. Oh, I need to swing better. or I need to hit it longer. Mm -hmm. I need to do this. I need to do that. And yet we know what the attributes are of when you were at your best. You know, here's where I would generally thank you for being on the show and and wrap it up. But (laughs) I I still have more questions. So please stick around. We'll do one more segment, um, but we'll be back. We need to take one more time out. Let's talk about Golf Smarter Mulligans. On the current episode, which is available now, we shared our very first conversation with Tony Manzoni. I bring this up because Golf Smarter listener Rich W. wrote to me and said, 
The swing technique Tony described fascinated me, and Tony's descriptions were so vivid that I was able to apply his single pivot swing from your podcasts alone. Yeah, Tony's description was so good that Rich was able to implement it successfully just from listening to the podcast. No YouTube, no video, just listening. So the next thing that Rich did to help him remember the steps involved in this swing, he created a one sheet that succinctly breaks down Tony's single pivot swing into four parts. If you'd like a copy, I've made it available for a one-click download on the blog post at golfsmarter.com for episode 159 of Mulligans dated May 20, 2022. It's yours for free. Please check it out. But this week on Mulligans, we talked to Jack Sims, who spent years as a successful golf coach until he realized that so much of what he was teaching was actually applicable in business as well. Jack Nicholas says 90% of a golf swing is in the fundamentals. The fundamentals for me are, remember the old gasp concept, grip, alignment, stance, and posture. If you can get the grip, alignment, stance, and posture right, you're well on your way to a really good golf swing. You can use the same analogy, gasp, in the world of business. The same thing, grip, alignment, stance, and posture. It's the same stuff. That's Golf Smarter, episode number 160, featuring Jack Sims. We want you to enjoy the best of Golf Smarter podcasts that are no longer available in any podcast app, which is why we created Golf Smarter Mulligans. Game improvement and interesting golf conversations never get old. That's Golf Smarter each Tuesday and Golf Smarter Mulligans released every Friday. Please subscribe and review us from wherever you listen to your podcasts. Dr. Izzy, tell me, what what are like the top five neuroscience discoveries that you've uncovered working with golfers and other athletes? Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful question. So I think that some of them we have covered, but let me just go through them. The first is that there is no muscle memory. The second is that our brain controls Three things, muscle sequencing, muscle force, and target. We did not know this before. The third thing is that um, there is electricity in the brain that has to travel to our muscles. And if that electricity is in alpha and theta mode, which is very low frequency, then those three things can happen optimally. The other thing is that the most expensive shot in golf is a mistmakeable putt. It is unbelievable to me how high and for how long the brain waves spike when you miss something that, you know, is a two footer or 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 a three footer. The other thing is that the amount of judgment, the amount so judgment is noise basically, which we we can measure, that happens that golfers do after every shot is more than I have seen in any other sport. In basketball, if I miss a shot, yeah, I might be bad for half a second, but I got to run back quickly right. and play defense. Right. In every other sport, there is some version of that. Even in individual sports like tennis, if I make a mistake, there's still another person over there, but in golf, it's just you and you. So I view me- competitive golf, not recreational golf, but I've just seen this happen too much. I view competitive golf as a mental health risk. Because the amount of judgment, the amount of spike, um, I play with friends who, if they have a bad round, they'll tell me, yeah, you know, dinner's going to be awful with my wife or, or some version of that. And so competitive golf where you have so many junior golfers, so many mid-tier golfers playing a lot of the, a lot of the mini tours um, in, in, in every level, the amount of stress that they're putting their brains through. Um, You know, I think athletes have made it okay just recently in the last two or three years with Michael Phelps and Simone Biles. Just this week, there was an athlete that uh, committed suicide. Uh, Two months ago, the, the goalkeeper at Stanford committed suicide. But, you know, there's a lot of pressure to perform well because you people are watching you now. Before you could do well and you'd have to read about it in, in the paper. Well, now it's instant. 
there's instant scoring, there's instant, you know, videos, there's people that are judging you constantly. So, and because you, you, you really can't blame anybody in golf other than yourself, unlike other sports, you know, golf is, if you play competitively, it can be a serious mental health is, you know, issue. So we have to be, we have to acknowledge the significant role of the brain in golf. Um, it can also be incredibly therapeutic because it is outside. And ge- geospatially, you are, you know, nicely cut grass, ponds, flowers, trees, manicured. I mean, it's a wonderful walk in the park. Let's if you didn't not have forget to wildlife. It, 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 exactly. And wildlife, absolutely. And the wind blowing and the sun shining on your, on, on your back. And if you have a good set of friends, just talking a lot of smack can be just a lot of fun, too. <laughs> But that's why I'm saying there's a difference between recreational golf and competitive golf. They're not the same sport. And I view competitive golf, not recreational golf, as a mental health issue. And I would just ask if you are listening to this podcast and you're a competitive golfer or you are this parent of a junior golfer, is to just really be aware of the of the cognitive impact of, you know, poor shots and poor rounds. And, you know, it's very easy for good parents to unintentionally damage their children, and I've seen it happen live in person countless times, um, and 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 it really robs that kid of 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 a healthy lifestyle uh, and a sport that they can play for the rest of their lives. So you're saying that competitive golf is could be a mental health risk. One hundred percent. I have too wow. much evidence, and I have too yes because of the judgment. Remember, you have time to judge after every shot. There mm-hmm. is a score. And most of the time that you beat, you, you lose in golf, it's because you beat yourself, right? Yeah. You, yeah. you think back and, like you just said, that the, the three putt from, from, from nine feet yesterday for you. Yeah. Now, yeah. luckily, you, you have a real job. But if you're a junior golfer trying to get a scholarship or if you were playing in college, and you're trying to make uh, the team, and that putt costs you a spot on the team, or you're a professional mini tour golfer, and you're trying to make a cut because it costs you more to play than you will earn. Um, you know, you know, it's it's a serious mental health health risk issue. I have seen too many broken people. Um, there's a golfer that just came out, Willie Wilcox. Uh, I give him great credit. You know, he said he started doing drugs, um, and like heavy drugs because of the toll of, of that. So, you know, this is a, a silent killer. Mm. Um, and unless you're a top 50 or 175 PGA Tour player, it is a struggle out there. It is a real struggle out there. It's a financial struggle. It's a logistic struggle because you're traveling, you know, state to state and, and golf tournament to golf tournament. You're staying at hotels and eating bad food and, and not able to work out. And um, so I, 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 I worry that a lot of golfers, competitive golfers, I should underscore, you know, aren't taking care of their mental health because golf is such a mental health, competitive golf is such a mental health risk. Wow. Where does visualization fit in for you with this? Or yeah, you, yeah. you talk about sequencing, but you also, you know, how does that fit? Yeah. So I think that the initial intent, and I know many, many coaches, and some of them are actually friends of mine, uh, golf instructors that are a big fan of, of that. And I am a fan um, of the concept of it. I'm not so much a fan of the visualization concept. So let me explain. Um, the brain loves a target. And a target is slightly different than visualization. Mm. So the problem with visual, uh, first of all, it's a good thing. But the challenge I would say with visualization is that in three seconds or so, the mind is going to wander on average, right? So it's good. Visualization is a form of taking that target. But I have found that 75% of the effort should be to retain the target in your head as opposed to taking the target, So this is where putting comes into play. I think the most under-practice part of putting is the ability to hold the target. 
People talk about the line and speed all the time, all the time. And I will tell you, according to my brain trackman, and I've done 10,000 of these, over 10,000 of these, is that you can pick the right line and, and the right speed that you want to apply. But if you're over the ball and you suddenly lost where the target is, you will apply the, long, the wrong stroke because now you're, you're, your mind is saying, where does this go? And did mm. I, is it here? Is it there? Or do I change my mind or that? So I think the ability to hold a target in your brain, which is a learnable skill, is the most important part of putting, not line and stroke. There are many lines to a hole, and each line has its own speed. And I don't like the term speed. I like the term force because force is what you do to the ball so that the ball has speed. And that force is created by the brain. The brain will know what force to apply if there's a target playing in its head. But like I said, your eyes are down at the ball. So you have to remember the target. Mm. And no one practices that. Right. So I caddied for one of my clients on the, on the Corn Ferry Tour. And so I went out there Monday and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, on this practice round. And if you go to, the, to, the, to a, a professional tour event and go to the putting green, you will see about 200 putting training aids. Everything from trees, tees to mirrors to, oh, my God, you know, to jackets and, and shoes. And, and that's good. But I will tell you, all of that is for naught if you're over the ball putting in the middle of competition when your brain waves are high and your brain cannot recall or retain exactly where the ball is going to go. So it's more your ability to, again, like I said, it's not taking the target, it's holding the target. There's a difference. Does that make sense, Fred? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, all right, let, let's wrap this up with what, as amateur golfers and some competitive golfers, and I mean competitive not on a professional competitive, but, you know, your sure. local competition, give us some drills. What can we do to take advantage of this information that you've developed? Absolutely. So, you know, everyone talks about breathing, and, and that is one technique. And, and however, I will tell you that there are probably 20 different breathing techniques that, that, that you can do. And I'm a fan of sort of most of them. So that's just one. I didn't invent that. But I invented many other neuro hacks. And if you go to the website, jiragoff.com, many of them are there. So, for example, I'll just teach you, I'll just teach you one right now that is the equivalent of about 20 minutes of, 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 of yoga. So let me just have you, do you have anything in your hands, like a pen or a pencil or a paper? Yes, have, there you go. Okay, you have, you have a pen. So what I want you to do is I just want you to close your eyes and use both your hands on the pen, and I want you to take 20 seconds and try to feel as many different things on that pen that you have. Should I be narrating this? I mean, this is a podcast. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, it's an Apple pencil, so I feel uh, the tip of it that is not writing on me. Um, I can feel the line that separates the tip from the body of it. I can feel that it's uh, round uh, all the way around except for one flat edge and that it's uh, rounded on the top. Okay, let's just pause there. Now, if I had my brain machine, my brain trackman on your brain, which I've done thousands of times, while you were describing and trying to feel what you were feeling with that pencil, I will tell you that your mind wandering reduced. You were not thinking about the end of this call or the beginning of this call because you were trying to find those things. And in that moment, you reduced your, your brain waves. You began to eliminate your past and your future because you were focused on trying to sense something in your hands. And in golf, we all have a grip. And you can take two or three seconds before every shot and just feel the grip. And that two or three seconds to feel something unique through your hands because our hands have the highest number of nerve endings. Our hands, the bottom of our feet, and our face have the highest number of nerve endings, which means receptors to the brain. So by just feeling that for two or three seconds and say, well, let me just feel the edge of this wrap. That's it. 
that can allow your brain to go into alpha theta mode for at least the next 30 seconds, long enough for you to hit that shot. Wow. So that's what we call a neurohack. And okay. there are dozens of these that are validated. So I also have an app out there called Jira Golf app, and it will teach you how to use the scale of one through 10 so, so that you can apply the right neurohack based on where your brain is. And uh, but when you were doing this that, app, is this app available on both iOS and Android? Yes, yes, it's called Jira Golf. G Y R A Jira Golf app. Okay, I'm in. Correct. Yes, I'm so in. <laughs> um, because interestingly, when you were talking about the door slamming and that being a distraction, the first thing came to my mind was when my feet are either it not level in a little bit of a rut, or if I'm stepping on a tee. It's a total distraction and that, that can keep me away from having the shot that I'm hoping to do. And also, when you said on average three seconds, I'm glad you said average because I know I'm on the one second side. <laughs> I'm yes. easily distracted. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and the key point is not that everybody is easily distracted, but you're easily distracted by yourself. Yes. Like it's our own minds no that is the largest distraction. We think it's our phones or this or that, and they are a distraction. But our own minds, the, the, the multiple monologues that are going on, you know, that's the biggest distraction. Fabulous. Jiragolf.com, G Y R A, and the Jiragolf app that has neuro hacks for you to. Uh, take advantage of this information this has been really I, i'm so glad that you guys reached out to me and found me that i love this stuff thank you so much dr justice my pleasure fred i look forward to working with you some more well i never guaranteed you that i would just be talking about swing mechanics <laughs> and we are going to cover the gamut of anything golf if we can find it and that is where it goes. That is fascinating stuff. Today's episode was introduced by Mark Cook of Olitha, Kansas. He's also getting the opportunity to choose a gift he'd like to receive for opening today's episode. Now, wouldn't you like to be part of Golf Smarter and get a free gift just for leaving a voicemail? Well... We actually have a variety of prizes to choose from. So write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and let me know that you'd like to introduce an upcoming episode and I'll send you the instructions. If you have any questions, comments, oh, and as far as the instructions, if you feel like you're one of those people that are, that you know, like you freak out over getting technical instructions, no, no, no. I'm giving you a phone number and telling you what to say. It's real easy to do. So if you have any questions, comments, suggestions for upcoming episodes, please click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.